I hereby call the meeting to order of the Northampton Urban Forestry Commission uh, at 4.33 on Wednesday, September 20, 2023. And I'm so sorry, my, um, my agenda. Okay, there we go. We have a public comment period. Is there any, I don't see anyone from the public. So um, I guess there's no public comment. So the next item is to review the minutes of September 6, 2023. Does everybody want a few minutes? And can you still hear me? Yes. Thank you. I do roll call, Susan. Oh, yes, I'm so sorry. That's okay. Um, Rich Parasoliti. Yeah. Yes. Susan? Yes. Richard Parrish? Yes. David? Yes. And Jordan? Yes. Okay, sorry yes. about that. I got a little off because the computer I'm working on didn't have the um, agenda, wasn't coming up. Um, so we had the roll call public comment. We don't have any members of the public. So now we'll review the minutes from September 6th. Give everyone a few minutes for that. But let me know when you're finished. I, I read them. I've finished, but I have a comment, which I'll deliver at the end. David, you're muted. Uh, should I offer minutes comments here? Just uh, under the headline, incorporating native shrubs into the setback mix. Mm -hmm. um, the second or third sentence, Rich said we're not in the practice of removing public shade. It's, we are not in that practice we add the word we to the sentence yeah we we are and also uh the sentence before it still would offer the same benefits of the tree i think it would clarify to say shrubs and understory trees offer many of the same benefits as larger trees something like that sorry bonnie you're muted Shrubs and under what trees? Under story trees. Oh, okay. AKA smaller trees. Yep. Okay. I have a, a comment. Go ahead. Uh, under the uh, the fall planting discussion, the last line, Jackson Street trees are high on the radar. Should that be Jackson Street school trees? Or did it mean the street? I think it's the street, but I could be wrong because you know how we lost the London plane trees Yeah. further along okay. towards Big Y on the right. Right, right. Okay. I guess, I, I, I don't know for sure. That's valid. Very good. Well, I think it's, 
we could have Pri primarily Jackson, Street. Jack Jackson Street School, though, right? Because aren't we replacing a whole bunch of trees that died on the campus? Okay, put you can put school in there. That's fine. <laughs> you know, there's the housing area a little further along the street, really? which we were also uh, considering very right, important. Right. Yeah. Okay, yes, that you're correct. The school is very important, and the other part we could put school and. Bonnie, it would be okay if you want to add Jackson Street School and um, Jackson Street. Okay. Yeah. Yes, thank you. That way, everybody knows that we care very much about both of those areas. Sure. Okay. Any other comments on the on the meeting minutes from from September six? Nope. Okay. Um, do we have a motion to accept the meetings of meeting minutes of September six as amended? Yes, I move that Thank we you. accept. Do we have a second? I'll second that. Yeah. All in favor? I think we need a roll call again on this one. I recall. Um, okay. Rich? Yes. Susan? Yes. Richard Parrish? Yes. David? Yes. And Jordan? Yes. So moved. Thank you. Okay. And now on our agenda, we have the chair report, which we'll um, push to later in the meeting in hopes that Rich will be off the road and safe. Um, fall planting discussion is the next item. And um, I can speak to Saturday. We had our first Saturday planting last Saturday. Um, Rich Parrish, are you able to speak at all to the Wednesday or? No, I, I did not participate. Okay, they have been planting as well. So we are underway. Um, we have, again, Wednesday group and the Saturday group. And we're starting to get some trees in the ground. Um, I don't know the exact number. I don't have the overview. Jen is really um, providing that for us. And she is out today. She is away. Um, I know we planted 10 on Saturday. And so I would we're, we're above 20 by now and more to come in the next weeks up until the end of November. Um, we have again on the agenda incorporating native shrubs into the setback mix. David, would you like to speak to that? Uh, I, I would be happy to, but I, uh, I sent that list to Jen in hopes that she would uh, uh, apply her expertise in you know, winnowing down that list. So it, okay. it might be best to wait until she's on the case and can speak to the, the shrubs and trees, unless Rich, you, you feel qualified to. Uh, David, I, I put the... Uh... I put the list together. I just basically cut and pasted what you sent in the email yeah. and, and put it in that document. So we had it, that, um, that document lives in the, uh, urban forestry drive. Mm -hmm. Um, so we could actually, all of us can easily access it because we all have access to the drive. Um, and my only comments, my only comments, uh, thank you. First of all, for the list, I think it's great. Um, I would like to, run a comparison with that list um, against our uh, tree list and planting guidelines list. Cause I think there's a little bit of overlap for some plant material that we have um, in there already, but, um, and Je I think Jen and I were, Jen and I are still supposed to go through that whole tree list and planting guidelines um, for a review and we haven't done that. So that would be the time when we want to do that as well. But I, again, thank you for the list. and. I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, so that, that's my only comment for now. I would add that the list 
if I understand correctly, was attached to the meeting invitation to the commission. And it's called possible additions to existing tree setback mix. So Rich distributed that when he sent the meeting agenda. And David, could you um, say where the list came from? Uh, sure, it is a it is a partial list based on um, Douglas Tallamy's book about um, natives that are good for the Northeast. And uh, I just kind of tried to pick a few understory trees and a few shrubs and conifers based on really the, the ones that I'm familiar with, which I think don't aren't too unruly um, and could be uh, are sort of a nice height in some cases. So that, that's the origin of the list. Oh, thank you. That does give some some context. A, a comment, please. Uh, on, on some of the, say, the shrubs, do we run the risk of, say, getting into landscape planting as opposed to just shade tree? Uh, and should the city be involved in landscape plantings in setbacks? Yeah. I think that's a valid point because our our mission is shade trees providing that cooling for the the hot years to come so it is something we you know should probably think well about the taxpayer money yeah i i, I certainly i certainly agree with that i think you 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 could argue that a grove of trees or a grove of trees, understory trees and shrubs, mimics a forest and you're just gonna get more humidity in that zone and more cooling um, than you are if you have trees planted 20 feet apart in a row. I mean, I... Yeah. yeah, and we get a lot of questions about native as well. Um, Jen did a nice job on a, a little one page about um, having to choose plant material that can withstand the um, the rigors of being a you know public shade tree too. So and I don't know where these these particular trees fall in yeah. on that. I mean, it is great to have trees make a lot of flowers for pollinators so that is a really nice thought does anyone else have any comments they'd like to chime in with sure this is jordan uh can you guys hear me i'm in my truck yeah thanks jordan sure not at all um i would just say that um you know, shrub is sort of a variable term and there are sort of uh, some understory trees slash uh, shrubs, which even under power lines, you know, we have where we want to plant, we have to choose those types of species. There are many that are native, some of the viburnums, dogwoods, et cetera, that would sort of fit that bill. So I think it kind of behooves us to go sort of species by species. Uh, there, I think there's a role for those uh, types of plant material uh, where we're not necessarily stepping into the landscape zone per se, we're still providing canopy, um, but we're sort of being mindful of, of the, um, the types of large shrubs slash small trees that can provide ecosystem benefits, that can provide some canopy, that can provide habitat and greening. So there's space for that. Yeah, that said, I think um, if we're talking about the setbacks we're planting on land 20 feet within the public right away, we might anticipate some people interpreting, you know, the, the appearance that it's providing landscaping. Um, just something to think about, you know, if we're going to start trying to do that. Um, next up on our I don't know. Do you want, uh, is there are there any more thoughts before I move on or 
Yeah, yeah Sue, I, I just want to thank you, Sue. I want to just say that I agree with everything, everything that uh, David, uh, Rich, and, and Jordan had to say, and you as well about the plant material. And I, I do see, I do see the value in um, in in using utilizing some plant material off that plant list potentially to create um, for a better term, I guess I don't I don't want to say landscape plantings, but plantings that we can actually um, use alongside um, tree plantings because I think uh, my experience is and I'm, I'm sure other people that have gone out inside of trees is that when we go to site a tree, a setback tree, you know, the first question is somebody, like, how big is the tree get? Well, what do you have? I don't want that. I don't want that large tree. So sometimes you sort of have to sell. And I, and this is not a really the right term, but sometimes you have to sell multiple things to folks. Like you have to give them a choice of, well, we have this medium size tree, which, and then we have these understory, this understory plant material that would, that would, um, you know, go right alongside of this large tree. And I think, um, I think it's a really good, I think it's a really good way to start looking at things because I think we have to realize that the ecosystem benefits of large trees are extremely important and you can't replace them, but there's many, other, there's a lot of other plant material that we could be thinking about um that would fit into what we're trying to do as well i guess and but i guess how we go about that is like jordan said you've got to take each piece of plant material case by case and sort of work through it um at least that's my 27 27 cents and the reason i'm i'm thinking this as well is because we had a um i wasn't there but when they delivered the trees yesterday a resident came out on woodlawn and did not want a large tree there. Um, there was supposed to be a silver linden planted. They wanted a red bud. Um, there's no overhead wires there. So I asked Brooke, uh, you know, can, can, it, can you accommodate two trees there? Can you, and she says, well, it's possible. She said, but I, I don't want to be the judge of that. Plus there might be utilities in the way. So again, it's, and that was not a setback scenario. That was just a tree belt scenario. But again, I think people are, people like choices <laughs> you know they do they like flowers yeah and some people like flowers some people don't like flowers you know we found that <laughs> out people don't want lilacs on when the arbor day whip giveaway they want something else you know and um but i totally think it's definitely i appreciate david bringing mission because i think it actually um could also maybe increase our visibility a little bit and also possibly dovetail with other parts of the city sustainable plan um, that are talking about po other pollinating plant material. I'm not talking about um, like perennial, I'm talking not talking about per like uh, perennial gardens, but in essence, trying to give, see if it's possible to use other plant material through the setback program to achieve, you know, all of our common goals, I guess. I think I've said enough. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, these are all really lovely plants too. Um, and certainly cooling if clumped together. What would the um, pruning of these types of plants be like compared to what we're struggling with with the trees? Does Jordan perhaps or Rich, either Rich have an idea of like how they compare? Are sure, there I'll, I'll jump in. Uh, this is Jordan. Um, I think, you know, yeah, of course, if um, the idea is to get them small enough where we can do some preemptive pruning and prune them for correct habit um, and strength of, um, you know, the structure of the tree. And so, yeah, I think I, don't, I think the, the difference would be over the long term, they're going to stay closer to the ground and will require less bucket truck, less climbing, this kind of thing. Um, you know, things like, like sourwood, um, someone mentioned redbud, uh, black hall viburnum. Um, there's, there's a fair amount uh, with hazel, perhaps uh, native and non-native things that we could prune uh, when young to scaffold them correctly from a structural standpoint. And then the maintenance going down the road will be uh, ideally uh, a little bit less. 
Well, that's a plus. Most definitely. Um, any other comments for now? Or I mean, it's a. Well, if, if, if I could, if I could just circle back to oh, Rich Parrish's uh, original question, a good one. What's the, you know, can this be justified? I think that, you know, shrubs offer, they like, there's a list of benefits. It's probably worth reiterating that they can reduce stormwater runoff by intercepting and storing rainwater, filtering pollutants, uh, really the same thing that larger trees can do, which is very much of a public good. And um, I do know from my, you know, anecdotal experience that people do like the choices, as Rich was saying. Yeah, for sure. It's true. And they do really care about, you know, native and pollinator. And, um, you know, it's always been our, our priority to try to get the largest tree in any appropriate spot as possible. So it is, um, you know, a, a, a different way of looking at it than trying to, as we've always done, if we see a spot, we like really want to try to get as much impact as we can with the dollars we have, which is the largest tree. But um, I'm really interested in learning more about it. On that note, um, may I move on to the next item on the agenda? I don't hear any. Um, anybody um, speaking? So we'll go ahead. The next thing on the agenda is Rich, something Rich has been mentioning over the months is the need for an urban forestry master plan discussion, which dovetails with what we're just talking about, the idea of direction we're going in. And um, fantastic timing. I see Rich here. Um, I'll just um, also introduce the topic by pointing to everyone that there is a, um, there was information in the email from Rich today about this topic. There is a link to the um, Cambridge Mass Government Department of Public Work, Works Initiatives Urban Forestry Master Plan. There's also a link to boston.gov Urban Forest Plan. And there is, there is one attachment, I believe, that is, let's see what it is a request for qualifications for a master plan. Rich, would you like to jump in now and lead this part? Sure. Um, so what I did is I gave you, like Sue just explained, I, I provided two links to the two different websites of the two communities. And since then I've learned there's another one, actually the town of uh, Brookline just finished there um urban forestry master plan which also doves, dovetails into their sustainable plan um and they i will dig that up and send that link to you as well so i think um i think one of the things that i've been thinking about uh and i think i've expressed this to uh the commission uh previously is that you know we we have built a wonderful foundation um in um the last uh I don't know how long has it been. It's been eight years, right? Eight years we've been doing this. So this is pretty. This is pretty incredible. So I have. Um, I. I am. Uh, maybe I'm uh, feeling my age a little bit, um, and I'll go right on camera and say that. But I mean, I we're we are all we are not all going to be here forever doing the same roles, doing the same functionality. So, and then and then with Kent's work, um, Kent's work is um, outstanding. Um, and I think they started to make me really think about that we really, the plan that we follow is a plan that we developed. You know, we, we're following like the, the Davy Resource Group uh, tree management plan, but sort of on a 10 year time frame, not on a five year time frame. That was the management plan 
that we got from Davy Research Group in 2000, the winter of 2017. Um, and you know that that plan has a lot of boilerplate type matrices in it. You must do so many routine pruning cycles. You must change the. You must diversify um, your the, your canopy um in this you need to plant 450 trees a year for the next five years um and then you know x y and z and it's very um it's, it's like dollars and cents and, and and which is fine but i think um and then we developed our own um goals and objectives as a commission outside of that plan using that as sort of a rough framework but I think um, as we have seen in the last um, eight years, um, you know, sustainable, uh, there's a, been a climate resiliency regeneration plan that was done by, um, you know, put together by the planning office of planning and sustainability uh, approved uh, or, and adopted by the mayor and the city council. Um, but really trees they're mentioned in that plan, but trees have a really small role. They have seemed to me like they have a very small, piece of the puzzle um and i actually think uh you know because i'm a tree guy i probably think a little more about trees than the average person um but i think that trees actually really create um they have quite a role in our environmental or in our uh sustainable systems that we have in the city and so i think taking a step back and taking a look at um how we can build like a permanent more permanent framework that can be adopted by our public officials if they if they choose to if they if they would like to do this obviously we are only advisory to the mayor so if the mayor does not want an urban forestry master plan then that's the mayor's decision but i wouldn't think that the mayor i, I haven't talked to the mayor about this but i i think it's time to think about this because we need to create a sustainable system for the future for the people that we're leaving this work that we've done so far. Um, and I think it would also help um, in better understanding um, what our needs are and basically all the information that we have in all these places, um, like all the trees we planted, um, the canopy coverage loss, um, the density housing changes. I mean, that's a whole nother topic that as we continue to move towards net zero, um, um, to the net zero goals of 2050, um, for the whole city, I mean, how is the city going to get to net zero? Well, the city just uh, uh, requested that they um, have the ability to um, have a um, different stretch code that allows, that basically forces any new construction to be fossil fuel free. So fossil fuel free um, comes in many forms, but the biggest one and the biggest unfortunate um, issue is that solar versus trees. So I feel like I feel like the city has really decided that the, you know the city has decided they want to we want to be sustainable we want to be carbon neutral by 2050, and these are the different ways to get there. I don't think trees necessarily have, um, are um, totally plugged into that sustainable model. They are plugged into it because we've made them plugged into it, but I think that the urban forestry master plan is. Um, something that should be standalone on its own and should actually give the city the framework or the guidance that it needs for however many years in the future to make sure that the program that we have or the initiative we started is sustainable, plus all the maintenance that goes along with all these trees, um, plus the budgeting, um, the operational the operational costs, um, you know, the, the, uh, even uh, to go as far as to say a, a risk management plan. Uh, many communities have risk management plans when it comes to trees. So, you know, Cambridge, I, I gave you both document, uh, the Cambridge document, because that's the one I had available to me. And I gave you the websites to sort of look at how they did, you know, what the end result was. So you could, so we could have a dialogue about this and sort of figure out if this is something that we are interested in pursuing. Um, and if we are wonderful, if we're not, then that's, you know, that's, I guess, okay, too. But I, I think it would be I think it would behoove us to at least have the conversation um, and go from there. And I'm sorry if I was really long-winded, but you just sort of, I just did a data dump, if, I, if I, you would say. So I'm, I'm, uh, I'd like you to, I'd, I'd like as much input as possible from, from commissioners on this. 
a, a comment here from Richard. Uh, just having a history of working with a lot of uh, consultant reports from a from my earlier life, like the one question that needs to be answered satisfactorily is, will will the such a report change any of our decisions, any of our methodology methodologies that we're currently following now uh, that to justify probably a significant cost of such report in that you know right now we're following probably best practices of the Massachusetts Arborist group. Uh, you know you're well plugged into that. Uh, and I imagine that such a consultant report will refer to the Massachusetts Arborist group for some of their expertise. Um, so, you know, would, would such a report change the way with, we're selecting trees, where we're planting, when we're planting, how we're pruning, considering our limited resources? Um, and that if, I, I really like the idea of having kind of capturing our institutional knowledge for future planners, for future generators generations but uh, but if uh, if it's not going to change anything that we're currently doing uh, I think we need to look hard at that for for again for for using the the city's money money in the best manner so um do you want, you want me to answer try to answer that question well I think, or, or is it just or does it, someone it, else have a comment similar to that? I, I I'll I'll just I'll just say something I noticed about the Cambridge plan to Rich's point is that uh, a goal is to engage and educate the community about the urban forest and uh, to promote tree stewardship and awareness among residents, businesses, and institutions. And that's something that we don't do. So I think, and I think that's an important that is an important goal. Uh, I don't know if it's necessary to adopt a master plan in order to do that. I'm in two minds, Rich. I agree with you when we, you know, spent money and the state spent money on our inventory. Yeah, you know, there was a little, there's always a little part of me that says, well, I could just, even me with no formal training, I can walk around town and say, we have an awful lot of old maple trees. We need to diversify our canopy and plant, you know, a lot of trees and have different generations of trees similarly but um it does give a certain um gravitas to what we do and that that data is important for for justifying what it is we're doing versus you know kind of a, a informal observation and I think looking at the Cambridge plan, it it gives a vision. They even have that right in the very beginning, you know, a vision for the trees. So it gives the community an opportunity, people who aren't really thinking about it so much to create a space for them to think about where trees fit into the place we live and in the larger planning, because all of these plans are going on. When we had the, um, the resilient, I forget all the terminology, but there's part of a sustain the city sustainability plan, which is part of the city's master plan. It was the resiliency part. Um, and throughout all of those documents, if you do a find and look for tree, it's woefully lacking in focus or vision in terms of trees. And we've seen it with the um, by right um building code changes to the zoning um where trees are not really thought of and we had to really work hard to get people to consider trees in any of these steps along the way and having it institutionalized um unfortunately <laughs> in some ways is plays a role in getting us to be part of the bigger planning of the future i don't know does that make any sense yeah i mean uh, i i mean uh, i i think it makes 
I think it makes a lot of sense. I think everything everyone has said makes a lot of sense. And, and I think what Rich is, uh, Rich's point is actually, um, and David's points are both really, are really good and pronounced. I think one of the things that I would like to say is that, um, you know, if we, if we were to go down this path, we, as the commission, um, and of course the mayor's office with the, with the mayor's, mayor's final approval, we really would be sort of the drivers um, along with probably um, other stakeholders. We would be the driver as to what the RF, uh, RFP looked like and what we actually wanted from someone um, in order to create this plan. It, you know, not every plan that I've seen actually may be the plan, a, a carbon copy of what we need um, and I think the opportunity potentially presents itself for grant funding to answer Rich's question about, um, you know, potentially reducing funding um, that's available to the present initiative that we have to, to basically circumvent that to add, um, you know, to stop planting, let's say, for example, and use the funding source to pay for the grant. I, I think you know, there was a the U.S. Forest Service released uh, 20, uh, $25 million worth of grant money this past last Thursday or Friday to communities in Massachusetts. Um, so, the, but that money, you know, the, 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 that's a grant funding source that we may not be eligible for because of the environmental justice percent of the Northamptons may not meet the minimum criteria, but we have to investigate all that. Um, but I think it would be, I think it would be important to, I think it would be important to think about this um, and actually incorporate all of the things that, uh, that everyone has just said. I think, you know, this is why I wanted to bring it to your attention and get your thoughts and, to, you know, determine uh, collectively if it's something that we wanted to pursue, um, if we thought that it would be beneficial in the long run. I mean, you know, in order, and I, and I think a community our size also, even though Northampton has, you know, 30,000 people in it, um, we are fortunate that we have a, uh, a decent percent canopy uh, coverage presently. And so, you know, and thanks to Kent for actually doing the analysis uh, to help us better understand that. And I think that we need to, um, sort of have a, a like a tool in our toolbox um, that gives uh, credence uh, or gives clarity to, for example, when the planning board would like to actually change the zoning to uh, density housing, you know, they did that in 2013 with really probably not a lot of understanding about how much canopy there was at the present time. And then what was what would be the projected effect of the loss of the canopy you know so there's a, that's just one example of why i think this would be important because the city council um the mayor's office you know they, they, they make decisions uh based on sustainability because of the sustainable plans that we have in place so i look at this tool as being another uh, template or a, a template for a, a, a plan um, that could also be used by the executive branch and by the legislative branch to guide how we get to our carbon neutrality in 20 and 2050, but also meet all of the other important things that we want to continue to do as a commission, um, you know, planting trees, working with volunteers, creating um, one of my things is like creating a risk management plan, et cetera. That, that's so this is why I wanted to bring it to all of your attention so you could actually read the documentation and and um, so that's that's where I'm coming from. Could know. we could we anticipate there will be tremendous pressure to start chop, cutting down the trees in Northampton? Uh, in, in, in what kind in of or uh, to meet the sustainability the um, net zero by 20. 50 goals uh, it that is really a hard i mean that is a hard i i i don't you know right now uh by right construction you can pretty much you do whatever you like on private property you know the only thing that you can't do is you cannot uh when it becomes site plan approval special permit or zoning variance significant tree ordinance applies so 
Um, you know, and I think also this, I think also, could, also, I think this would also help, help. Sorry if I'm, sorry if I'm hold on a second. I really meant public shade trees. I mean, trees that we've been planting even. Okay. You're frozen. No, hold on. All right, let's try. There you go. How's that? Okay, sorry That's about good. that. Um, I, you know, the, uh, th that's a good question. I mean, I've had a few interfaces with people that want to remove public shade trees because of solar, uh, potential solar uh, installations. Um, I think what I'm more concerned about uh, now is that the fact that we were going to go to fossil fuel uh, construction. So basically a single family home would be required by a certain date to be fossil fuel free if it was going to be constructed pr and present that has it says it's a home rule petition i don't believe it's been approved yet because it has to be approved by the state legislature i think mm -hmm. but it concerns me because you know the first thing that people comes to you come to mind when you're doing a fossil fuel free and a new construction part of that package is you know, solar and i think i sort of learned that lesson um, not in the not by single not by right construction single family homes, but on Birch Pit Road, where Habitat for Humanity um, is building, I believe, three units, and they basically were allowed under the Significant Tree Ordinance to basically clear cut the lot because of the fact that um, you know those homes are they're trying to get those homes to be net um, net zero, you know, and they were allowed to go back to the planning board and make adjustments um, about removing more tree canopy, but the replacement for the trees is nominal because it's under the significant tree ordinance. You know, that's just one example. Um, I, you know, I, I don't, I, I think there will be more pressure um, to build single family homes and two family homes on previously non-conforming lots, which will definitely impact the canopy. And then if you add this, um, you know, fossil fuel free element to it. I don't know what the end result is. And see, this is kind of what I'm think, talking about is in my mind is that, we, you know, we create what we think is um, the, a good and important thing to do in order to get us to carbon neutrality, which I'm not discrediting that. I'm not saying it's bad, but I think to get to carbon neutrality, it has to be a multi-pronged approach. And I think the focus, a lot of the focus for carbon neutrality through planning and sustainability has been by, um, you know, density housing, less cars on the road, um, more public transit, um, you know, people building homes that are, um, you know, like LEED certified, et cetera. So I think that I don't want to miss the boat, I guess, in essence, and allow and not have a say, not have a seat at the table because we don't necessarily have a professional overview of our own canopy and how we're managing it and how it plugs into that. Because again, if you remember, the Climate Resilience Regeneration Plan did not, did not really talk about trees much. It mostly talked about them in, in a more rural setting, like regenerative agriculture. It, that's the right. place that it talked about the most, which really doesn't have to do with our you know, street trees, our heat islands, our, you know, social justice areas. I mean, all the things that we care about as a commission. Yeah. So, I mean, again, um, it's, 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 yeah, I mean, I, 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 um, I just wanted to ask Kent, uh, Kent, do you have any input on based on your experience in Cambridge? I don't know if Kent Kent's picture is there, but I don't. Oh, uh, there. Yeah. It. yeah. Jordan um, needs to be admitted I again. To... I do actually. I've been waiting to chime in. Um, oh, good. A couple of thoughts. You know, it does raise the profile of trees, which sounds like an important goal. And just looking at the the Cambridge document that's the um, you know sort of the, the, the most prominent link that on the page that Rich sent to there are a lot of goals that are not 
or that are, that are broader than just like what would be a, a forestry commission goal. Um, you know, goals about how sidewalks are planned, how trees are planted, about coordination between departments. Um, you know, you have to scroll down past all the sort of like trees are good stuff in the document to get to the actual action plan, which is where the the recommendations are of the things that should be done. And there's recommendations for zoning, you know, some ordinance things. It's it's not just about planting trees. Um, so I th that's kind of to Rich Parrish's point of, is it gonna affect anything beyond what we're already doing? And I, I think it could kind of point the direction for other, other city bodies to take action. Um, the flip side of this, I would, I have to say, I think, well, well, before I get to that, one more thing is Cambridge having the advantage of the detailed canopy studies, the LIDAR studies, they, they could easily paint a picture of a canopy in crisis, um, which if you, if you go up, where is this? It's on page 17, where it shows you know, if we don't do anything, what's going to happen? If we try to plant some, what's going to happen? If we try to plant even more, and really the con the conclusions of the study was that there's almost nothing that the city can practically do to keep the canopy at the level that they want it to be. But um, so that's a spur to try harder, um, and it focuses on loss and planting. Um, the negative, I think this is, the document is really largely aspirational. Um, you know, this is recommendations to the city and it has as much force as this commission's recommendations do. Um, you know, it's, <laughs> so I don't know if anything's happened with the zoning. There's, there's huge conflict in excuse me a sec, in Cambridge between the affordable housing and the tree people, kind of similar to what you've been talking about between the net zero and the trees that, and the affordable housing seems to generally win. Um, there have been zoning changes for, to make of very dense affordable housing basically by right without um, any, um, Without any city oversight that has any teeth, there there it requires a planning board review, but it's a it's a, there's it's a non-binding. The conclusions of that review are non-binding. The planning board can't say you have to make these changes. Um, having this document, I know, has given the, the tree activists in Cambridge um, a little bit of a stick to beat on the city that. The relationship between citizens concerned with trees and city staff concerned with trees and city staff not concerned with trees in Cambridge is not really a good one. So that part I don't think matches uh, Northampton, but it, it's very adversarial there. Um, the feeling that the staff, city staff is not doing a good job with the trees. So this document does give a way to, you know, ask, okay, what's happening with these goals? You said, you know, we did this big report and said we should make these zoning changes or plant these trees and how many trees have we actually planted? So it's it's beneficial in that sense, but it's, it's non-binding. And so for anything to happen, uh, I think requires probably more activism, especially given the really severe conflicts between um, the affordable housing and the trees. And, and honestly, the great difficulty in expanding the canopy in Cambridge because um, the planting uh, opportunities in the public right of way are really limited. 
there are a lot of narrow sidewalks. Um, it's 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 very limited, and so I know there's some independent efforts to find uh, actually like backyard opportunities. I did some work a while ago to locate, try to find places where there's pervious surface, where there's not already a tree and it might be big enough for a tree. And uh, Green Cambridge, I think, has done some work with that. In um, that, excuse me, Kent, in that work you did locating private property, was that based on, what data was it based on? Was it based on LIDAR or what? Yeah, what it was complex. It was based on the LIDAR survey giving the actual tree canopy extent. And then Cambridge has a GIS layer of impervious surface. And so then you swap that around and you uh -huh. get pervious surface and subtract the actual canopy from that. Sorry then, to take you down. A, I was just curious. It's not necessarily data we have yeah, access to. No, and okay. actually they asked me for an update and I finally said, you know, I don't have the energy for this anymore. It was, it was a, it was, it was a difficult project, even given the data availability because of the the scale of, of the data, the GIS layers are, are very complex if you're mapping out all, every tree and every sidewalk and driveway and um, right, of, right of way in the city. That's really every every bit of paving. And I like kind of derailed you, but the, to get you back on track, you're saying yeah. that it is a tool. Yeah, I think the tool to raise the visibility and maybe maybe in Northampton create some urgency. I'm not really sure in, in Cambridge, it, it definitely did create some urgency around um, the, the need to preserve, to preserve against tree loss and to really plant any, any place you can put a tree, put a tree and and they're actually doing a lot of that. I mean, obviously I don't live there anymore, but they're finding like places on the borders of parks and doing experiments with um, Miyawaki forests that seem to be panning out. And um, so it, it's mixed. They also lost a lot of trees in a, in a major park last summer because of the drought and a, 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 failed, a failed irrigation system. So there, there's really, a lot of uh, different aspects to it. I'm curious what they experienced there with having more pavement for the bike lane. That's another area where oh. we want people to ride bikes to be healthy and save energy, but that, yeah. that adds pavement. That is a Track huge trees. issue. Actually in my old neighborhood where there's a park called Linear Park, which has a nice path winding through it and some trees and they've actually done some really nice planting there, but the path is um, in need of repair. And actually the whole park is kind of in need of a facelift and they put together a new plan, which included widening the path, which I think is 10 to 12 feet mostly now. And, and this is a highly traveled path by both bicycles and pedestrians. It's a very popular recreational and commute path. Um, so they wanted to widen it to 12 to 14 feet and that's going, and they also want to redo the um, the lighting. There's, there's lighting and the lighting is also, so there are many, many trees which are right against the existing path and substantial, you know, 12 to 18 inch trees. So the, the tree people, which are, there's some really strong tree advocates in the same neighborhood and they're just, yelling about this plan and I don't know how it's going to come out. Um, it's definitely a conflict. Um, then you, you look at the the Green Line extension, the community path extension that went in with that and there were some parts of that where the path is quite narrow because they didn't want to pay for it to be wider. So, you know, <laughs> I don't know when it's money, maybe the path is narrow and when it's trees, it's a battle. I don't know, but it's definitely yeah. but we, a fight in that neighborhood. And and with this, we have more and more of these conflicts as yeah, we conflicts with the fight. Yeah. And um, 
I don't know that there's been major plans similar to the, the Main Street plan in Northampton that wouldn't where they're putting in bike lanes and taking out trees. Maybe um, they're they're doing a lot of um, taking out parking to put in. Put yeah, lanes and they certainly would parking. have more space for trees without the bike lanes, but the bike lanes are an integral part of what the the people who weighed in wanted. Yeah. And actually it was more was, important than having more space for trees. Well, there was an ordinance that the bike lobby in Cambridge is also very strong. Oh, I bet. They got enough people on the city council to actually pass an ordinance. Well, not an ordinance. So city council has a um, city manager form of government. And most of what the city council does is advisory, actually. The city council has remarkably little um, force of law. They they draft the laws and they create the zoning, but they don't have the ability to tell the city manager what to do. They can only ask. Um, so I'm actually not quite sure how this ordinance has has the force of law, but they did pass an ordinance requiring protected bike lanes within a very short time frame on quite a few major streets. And that's been happening and it's mostly through taking out parking. Um, but I know there was there was some like Magazine Street, I'm not too familiar with that. There was a, a uh, there they did probably widen the sidewalk and take out trees, but that was a while ago and not in my neighborhood, so I'm not, so sure what was done with that. So there, there have been some projects where they've redone the whole street, including sidewalks and separate, you know, protected lanes that are next to the sidewalk. But the ones I'm aware of has not have not involved taking out trees. It's been taking out parking. Thank you for sharing that experience. Yeah, you're welcome. It is, and thank you again for getting us started to be able to have some presentations of data on where we are in terms of canopy, even though we don't have access to um, the best data. Yeah. It's a huge help. And I don't know if you're interested, I, I could send out a link to the work that I did for Green Cambridge. They have it on their website with the, um, I think they wanted 10 foot or 15 foot circles of uh, pervious surface um, and located actually a lot of possible locations. Um, wow. So um, we were... haven't talked about it in a while because it, it things have improved, but um, the coordination of departments was something that in the past, you know, we made some We've made some gains where there is a little bit more. It's better than it used to be, but I see that is part of the city of Boston's plan as well. Yeah, I, I can just speak to that just a little bit. Is that I, I you know, we're we're uh, very fortunate um, that the structure in Northampton is the way that it is. There's many many communities in Massachusetts. This is not the structure. The tree warden is a separate entity from the Department of Public Works or the City Hall. Um, there's no public shade tree commission of any kind. Um, and trying to get things done is very complicated. It's sort, it's sort of like uh, what Northampton was like when I got here. Um, and you have uh, departments working in silos and it, um, it can be very difficult and complicated um, that's changing, that's evolving. Um, Northampton's evolved. Uh, we're fortunate we have evolved to the point where we are. Um, and, um, but, you know, a lot of us that are here on Zoom and others that are not here with us any longer, meaning that they're not commissioners any longer or other employees that worked here, you know, those people are all part of this equation that made this to where we are today. Um, and, I just, from a, I guess, a more philosophical standpoint, I see the importance of making sure that everything that we've done um, is somehow codified in some kind of sustainable uh, model that continues long after we're not here. 
And, and maybe an urban forestry master plan is not necessarily the right way to go. I think not every plan for every community is like uh, fits every community. So Cambridge's plan um, is not the same. Boston's is not the same. Brookline, which is the other community, is not the same, probably. So maybe we don't maybe we don't follow these other models. Maybe we find another community that actually was is at the level that we're at. And, you know, what did they do um, to make this uh, initiative sustainable? So. You know, if if I were to retire, uh, Donna is to retire. Um, all of us on the commission are to, you know, move um, to uh, the Bahamas or something. I don't know. You know, I mean, there has to be there has to be a framework that has to exist, I think, um, because the, I, I'd have to say I'm going to use the words of Jim Nash or actually I'm not going to use this exact words, but Jim Nash said to me, he said, the Urban Forestry Commission or the tree, tree Committee or Tree Commission is the most active commission in the city that's gotten the most done. And so, you know, uh, Councilor Nash, I don't think he's been to one of our meetings. He may have, I don't remember. Um, but I think that sort of speaks volumes. So I think we have a, we have a great, we have a great initiative. We, it's, it's solid but I really feel the need that we need to actually continue this, but also create it, make it uh, so it's sustainable for, for others. And so maybe the plan that I gave to you at Cambridge is not what we need, but it's something for us to look at. And then I, I really appreciate Kent's um, insight because I think it's important to hear from others that have, um, you know, like inside knowledge or, or on the ground type experience uh when it comes to this and maybe what we maybe my suggestion we might want to bring a few people in that have done um this type of master plan and what it entails and what their experience is with it if you wanted to i'd be more than willing to but i'll i'll leave that up to to all of you if you're interested in pursuing some something that pertains to this so i don't know jordan you've remained pretty Pretty, pretty. Uh, you're not in your head over there, but <laughs> you can you can get a sense of what was required in Cambridge if you look at the documents section on that page. It was actually like a one and a half year process, and they created a task force that meet met many times and had public meetings. It was it was a pretty involved process in Cambridge. It's, it's pro probably something uh, like the uh, Main Street uh, Main Street redesign charrettes that they had um, where there was a lot of public input um, because I, I did, I looked at Cambridge's website and it, they did the uh, different categories that they actually brought to these individual meetings. They, they ranked them all percentage wise, which was important, which wasn't. They did the same thing. Sue, if you remember the design charrette we went to down at the, uh, the senior center or Yes, so it was like threat, climate threats. Yes, yep. Part of the resilience. Yep. Yes, yes. And that was what part are of the, the threats? Thing. How would yeah. they had yep. the community weigh in? You know, what would we really need? We'd need like places where everybody knew they could go to get water or et cetera. Yeah, people were very involved. They broke us up in groups. Yeah. Sounds like it. So, sorry, I, I, Jordan, you were going to say something. My apologies. Oh, no, I mean, I'm, I'm just, I'm nodding because, yeah, I, I agreeing, especially with the notion of sort of like, you know, something to, to a, a handoff of sorts, right? And sort of the go to, as you, as you said, if, if all the folks that uh, sort of are, are currently here or um, the capture current state, um, and then to plan for the future, the go-to is the urban forestry master plan. Um, if you know there are other ways or, to do it or other things to call it, um, but um, you know, I don't know, Davey is is a, I know you guys have worked with Davy already. They are one of the go-to um, you know vendors that do this kind of work. Um, but I think, however, it ends up being, I don't know if there's a need to sort of gain consensus on this and then sort of look at the different ways of doing that, that being sort of the handoff and sort of the, the thing to aim for. Um, 
I mean, it, may, it makes sense, right? Because there's so much has already gone. I'm just in a few months I've been involved here. I've seen how much has gone into um, getting the commission to this point and having sort of the, the level of type of influence that they have in the city. It's kind of unusual. And I've, if I may say, you know, I've been involved in a few, I'm, I, I know I work in Hartford and I, um, I've been involved in, in different tree commissions on the scale of Hartford and also on the scale of uh, Montpelier. It's sort of different. So this particular tree commission is like so civil <laughs> and so um, <laughs> civic minded. And so, so also sort of um, really about the work. Um, and it's just, it's a pleasure actually. So um, I'm, I'm very much in sort of the listen and learn stage, but uh, um, the notion of a master plan is, is in keeping with the types of uh, things that these commissions do and to remain relevant and to have their hand in uh, the types of projects big and also large that the city is about to embark upon. I mean, the Main Street project, uh, et cetera. So I'm a fan. Thank you, Jordan. Um, it's nice to hear a little bit about your background, what you're bringing in and your perspective to the commission too. We don't have a formal way of describing, you know, people's what they're bringing in their point of view, but thank you for sharing a little bit. And how are we doing on? So you're, do, so you're doing way better than I, I, I do. So you're doing great. You're, you're keeping time, you're doing everything. Well, you know, we didn't have a tree warden report. Should we? Uh, I, don't we know who the, I, don't, I don't even know who the tree warden is. Jordan, Jordan, you're in charge. And um, fall planting, I did not give much of an update. I know I helped plant 10 trees on Saturday. That's about all I could say. <laughs> so. No, it's all, it's, it's all, it's all good. I, there's not really a lot to report. I left it on there because I, I was just wanted to hear from folks how things went. That's all because I haven't been, I've delivered the trees and everything, but I haven't actually been at the plantings. But I gathered from the emails that I received, like most recently in the last day or two, that things have gone up well. So, um, I'm, 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 a, I'm ecstatic. Um, but I, I can, I can talk about, um, oh, whatever. What? Let's see. Let me see if I can find this agenda in front of me here. Hold on a second. Um, I can give you um, a quick chair report tree warden report um if you like now or i can wait to the end and then i can just update you on spotter lantern fly um well i i can say 28 trees have been planted there i'll, I'll inject that okay <laughs> but perfect. yeah go ahead okay so since we last met, um, this is my tree warden hat. Um, we have, you know, I, as you well know, I review driveway permits, uh, new permits uh, that for new driveway construction for single family homes, by right construction and um, driveway permits for planning board approved projects. So single family home, um, new home going up on the end of Park Hill Road, right near where the solar, the last large scale solar array was installed. Um, and um, I've, this permit's been kind of floating around for a while. It's been quiet. I haven't signed it because I needed to go out and look at the, lo the lot location. Um, I went out and looked at it. Um, they are actually needing to have a public shade tree hearing to remove some trees um, that are actually um, in, the, in the layout of where the driveway needs to be placed. Um, so I met with the contractor, a very nice person. And um, he said, oh, by the way, while we're here, we need to look at these other trees over here. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> Well, I said these trees over here. Well, we have to remove these public shade trees as well because we are putting the leach field for the septic system right on the other side of the public right of way, and we don't want any root interference. So instead of actually having just, you know, let's say half a dozen public shade trees that are probably under, they're all under, I would say, 15 inches. So they're not, they're not large trees by any means. Um, or under, let's say they're under 10 inches. Um, we now have more trees to remove because the septic system has to be close to the road because of the lot layout. 
So I have to go back there tomorrow to verify the list that the contractor sent to me of um, what trees he marked, if they're correct, um, the name of the trees and whether or not they constitute a public shade tree or not. The majority of them do. And part of the problem is, is that because uh, MGL 87 still um, you know, says that a tree uh, inch and a half uh, um, in diameter, um, one and a half feet off the ground is a public shade tree. So, um, so that's one thing I will get back to you on that. So, and again, my, the reason I'm telling you this in sort of long form is because this is sort of like the process that I have to go through. Um, and, and because of the uptick in construction uh, in Northampton, single family home, um, construction and projects approved by the planning board is putting pressure on our our canopy, um, our street tree canopy in ways that I don't think was anticipated um, back in 2013 when they passed um, this density housing ordinance where they made non-conforming lots now conforming. So that's just a point of clarification. Um, um, I have not uh, had a conversation with the, the person on Maynard Road about the solar. I'm sort of, I'm waiting to see what happens um, with the other very large mature tree that's in decline there. So I'm just kind of going to reach out to them as well. Uh, let's see. Uh, Wait, what's the address on Maynard where? Uh, it's the last them? house on the right-hand side. And I don't remember the address off the top of my head, but it's the last house okay. on the right-hand side. A uh, couple of things coming up. So um, the um, the next meeting we're going to have October 4th, um, that's the scheduled meeting. We will end up with the same situation where I um, the meeting has started and Sue and Bonnie are hosts so they can manage it because I'll be coming back from um, mass qualified tree warden training. The following meeting, which is the 18th of October, the 18th of October or the 17th? Let me just double check. I'm just gonna pop in and say, I'm, I'm at the same training as Rich, so, so I'm sort of a little bit scrambling to, to get here on time. So the 18th of October, I'm not gonna be able to be at the meeting. I'm gonna be in Washington, DC. I'm gonna be at the World Urban, the World Forum on Urban Forestry for the week. So I, I will uh, leave that to if you if you folks would like to have a meeting without me, you're more than welcome to. I can make I can set it all up. Um, but if you wanted to cancel that meeting again, we can talk more at length at our next meeting about that. Um, the uh, October um, let's see October first, second, and third. I'm going to be off to the ISA New England conference, which is in Portland for for three days. Um, wow. to do a bunch of, yeah but it's good because I'm going to be doing a bunch of networking with peers but I'm also going to actually hopefully connect with some other urban foresters around New England um, and hopefully I can put my feelers out about um, what we just talked about and, and some type of urban forestry master plan framework what people have done in other states because I think we could there's a lot to draw on for us so that that'll be helpful and then as I said I'll be gone October um 14th through the 20th um and then again there's two other uh there's two other um wednesdays in in november that jordan and i will both sort of have the same schedule and then that that's the end of the mass qualified tree warden training um the other thing i wanted to mention and this is uh i i was fortunate enough to uh apply and then be accepted to be a what they call a uh, municipal forestry um, institute which is sponsored by the society of municipal arborists they act they have a annual training um, and i actually was i was very interested in uh, being one of the facilitators for the training educational facilitator so i would my application was accepted so i'm going to be participating with their education committee um, remotely uh, between now and February, uh, developing the curriculum for the uh, Municipal Forestry Institute, which is actually going to be in person in Georgia in um, late February, early March. So there's 20, there's 20 uh, foresters 
uh, industry leaders, uh, educators that have been selected to be on this um, on this committee from uh, throughout the country. And apparently there's other from other countries as well. I'm, I'm not quite sure. I haven't met them all. I'm having a kickoff meeting in October, but I might be gone for a week in March uh, to Georgia to potentially participate as a in-person facilitator. So um, kind of exciting uh, for me, but uh, what's super exciting is that I think part of the propelling my, um, my application, the part that really sort of probably shined was all the work that we have done together as a group um, and all the volunteer work that we've done together um, and work partnering with Tree Northampton and other volunteer organizations and trying to actually create a sustainable urban forestry initiative, which you know, I think was, my experience is unique. There are a lot of communities that have um, different types of uh, urban forest uh, assistance from either, uh, you know, a nonprofit, but not, not the rounded experience that I, I've had here. And so I just wanted to say thank you to all of you for, and all the people that are not on this screen um, for actually making this whole initiative possible, but then also providing me with the opportunity to hopefully provide training using our model that we've been very successful at for others throughout the industry. So kind of really exciting, something different. It's leadership training. I'm typically like always training people on how to plant trees correctly or prune this this way, or don't do that. Or, you know, uh, let me show you how to do that. Can I have that shovel please? You know, and this is totally, totally different. So it's really, um, it's really, um, going to be interesting. So I'm looking forward to it. So well, you deserve these opportunities. I think, I don't know if everybody here knows most do that. Um, the tree commission, the department of public works and tree Northampton won a new England wide award for working together. And it's taken each pillar of that stool, the three entities, working together to create that model of success how we've worked well so yeah it, it has and and a um, big role yeah it's and it but speaks, i'm more worried about getting all our trees delivered which is this which is the ants view you know <laughs> yeah no no but no 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 not at all we'll I figure mean, it out it's all it's all important and i think too i i think the inflation <laughs> reduction act that released all that money I was speaking about earlier is really, you know, that's that money's available in these awards for five years. So the community has five years to spend the funding, but there's going to be more grant awards. Um, I think for uh, up to up to 10 years. So we are really like, we are like, we're sort of like cutting a cutting edge community and how we've utilized the uh, public private partnerships to actually make an urban forestry initiative happen um, and there's a lot of stakeholders and we've been really fortunate that we've had a lot of buy-in from a lot of stakeholders and a lot of positive buy-in some negative of course but i think that those those bumps are important but um i'm i'm proud to actually uh represent our community um at these different uh, industry events that i go to and uh it's uh I, i'm just one i'm one person you know, this this has been done collectively, and I, I remind people of that, and I remind myself of that all the time. So again, thank you. Um, and that's really, and I'm probably forgetting. Anything something. on the spotted lanternfly? Yeah, so the spotted lanternfly. Molly sent me the letter. Um, I am uh, working on a draft uh, email to the mayor's office and trying to get the letter positioned on a piece of letterhead and get it just... Um, get it so it, we can get it all into an envelope and then get need to get the mayor's approval to send it um, because it will be coming from, uh, it may, she may choose to send it from her own department. I don't, her own letterhead. I don't know that, but I am still working on that. Molly got me the addresses um, and um, she did get me the, the finished draft letter. So I'm, it's in my court. So I'm gonna take care of that shortly. So thank you. And no word on the STO. No word, no word on the STO. And I also, that's another, I have to follow up again on that. So STO and spotter lantern fly are two things I will. Thank I will. You. Yep. Yep. 
And that's all I have to report at the moment. We're getting down there on time, seven minutes. Um, any other business not anticipated by the chair? Um, I actually have a, while, while um, Rich is on the call, Rich, I um, can't share that data, the data set with you for um, the pruning. And uh, my apologies for not getting to you sooner. Kent, thank you for sending that. The only thing that that data is probably not going to have on that data list is the trees that were removed. The trees that died this past winter are not been have not been taken off that list, and um, the trees we planted this spring are not on that list. Yeah, correct. So uh, I think I think I need to. Um, I think you and I should just get connect over tell uh, over the phone or uh, maybe in person just to go over that data set, the, the one that I have that um, that's accurate, the most accurate one, the most updated one, and make sure that you get everything that you need. Yeah, that would be most valuable, including, yeah, yours includes dates pruned. Is that? Um, that's a good question, no. Okay, that's not in your database. Right. No, I don't, I don't, it might be in some of the older, um, the older, the previous years, but typically no, what, cause I was doing is I was creating a separate spreadsheet for Rob and I don't know whatever happened to them when they were filled, how he filled them out and got them back to me. They, that's, I think we sort of have to start afresh All right. from, from last year. So when you, so when you took over the, pruning um the management of the pruning effort i think we need to start from that point going forward and adding the dates which you did provide me of locations and pruning dates etc all right well let, we'll get together over at your place okay soon and then okay and that's fine all this stuff and coordinate all right perfect thank you all right that's that's all I that's the only comment I have. Okay, I don't know the protocol. I'm signing, kind of continuing to move the meeting forward. Yep, I mean, that's fine. Kind of... Okay. If no one um, else has anything, then you can. Anybody else? Other things you're thinking of, or things you've noticed in the community? Things you want to ask our tree warden here while we have him captive. <laughs> I'm only a phone call away, you know. I'm only I, I respond to text messages pretty well, you know, anytime. So. Oh, you do. But sometimes yeah. people like to just ask in person. Yeah, no, well, this is really in person, but I guess as close as we're gonna get at the moment. But yeah. Otherwise, I'll ask for a motion to adjourn. I make a motion to adjourn the meeting until our next meeting, October 4th. Yes. Um, do we have a second? Right. Second. Thank you. All in favor, show of hands. All set, Bonnie?